Um, this is a topic that I think a lot of people are vaguely familiar with. We kind of knew that the town burned down or almost burned down at some point. Um, and it was pretty serious. It was an, an event that happened almost 200 years ago. And we're coming up on the 200th anniversary of it. And it's an, an event that really reshaped uh, Newcastle. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. But first, let's let's think about what was Newcastle like in 1824? What was going on here? Well, um, it's it was uh, not too dissimilar um, in course layout from the way it is today. It was uh, still a small town, um, maybe a, a thousand to 1100, 1200 people in it at the time. Um, it's urban, so it's a very uh, closely developed town physically. It's a port town, of course, sitting here on the Delaware River. Uh, and then, like many towns in this time period, uh, once you get out of the town proper itself, suddenly you're in the countryside and you're surrounded by, by farms and agricultural land when it gets much more rural, much more spread out as you, as you move from the town center. Newcastle at that time um, was, of course, the county seat. It was no longer the capital of Delaware, but it was still a county seat for Newcastle County. It was the site of the courts. Of course, we have the courthouse here, the county jail. And people came here to take care of legal affairs. We had a great many um, attorneys in town, of course, judges. Uh, so if you had to do, do business that involved any type of legal um, documents, um, Newcastle, where's, where you were gonna come to get that taken care of if you were in Newcastle County. We also had very regular activities happening in town, including public markets uh, and of course church services. We have a variety of different churches here um, in Newcastle. So they serve not only the, the town itself, but people would also come in from outside the town. Farmers were bringing um, goods into the public markets um, to sell them. Um, people in town were of course purchasing them. And then of course that people were coming in to attend church services um, throughout. One of the things you hear us talk about a lot is that Newcastle was a hub of transportation. It was kind of a the central part of the of the transportation network along the eastern seaboard here. So people will be traveling up and down the, the mid-Atlantic here, and very frequently their travel route would include a stop in Newcastle. It was a place where you could change from land travel to water travel or vice versa. So um, consequently, here in Newcastle, um, there were businesses that sprang up that were that were taking advantage of that uh, transportation um, location. So we had transportation companies such as stagecoach lines um, or or uh, packet boat lines, and eventually these led to steamboat lines and railroads. Um, but they were they were um, based here in Newcastle. And then we had other people that were taking advantage of what we would call today uh, the hospitality industry or working in the hospitality industry. These are the tavern owners, um, the people keeping inns and hotels um, and offering services to people that were arriving in Newcastle, um, but had a bit of a layover before they could continue on their journey or just needed a space to rest. So that's what, what's going on kind of generally speaking in, in Newcastle. Let's talk about what it looked like uh, in town as well. You may recognize this um, image. It is from the survey of the town that was completed by Benjamin Latrobe and his associates in 1805. And we're kind of zoomed in on um, the area from the Strand, which is this street down here, then called Front Street. Um, up to the green, which is this part up at the top of the uh, of the page. And then of course you see Delaware Street running down this side. As you can see, uh, this does lay out Newcastle pretty, pretty nicely for us. You'll notice that the lots, as we know, are generally long, narrow lots. There are water lots down here on the river side of the Strand um, that have uh, Water lots allow people to build wharves out into the river. Um, if you were to look closely, if you go back in time and look at these buildings, you'd see that there was a mixture 
of building types and building materials here. Um, there were brick dwellings, of course, but there were also frame dwellings. Um, we had standalone residences and we had townhouses that were connected to each other. Um, there were buildings that were used as shops, buildings that were used as workshops, perhaps for someone, a skilled laborer like a blacksmith uh, or a carpenter. Um, along the river in particular, there were a variety of buildings that were storage. There were warehouses and other storage buildings there. And then most properties had some type of outbuilding on them. It might be as simple as a necessary, um, it could also be a stable um, or some other type of outbuilding like a smokehouse or something. Um, so there's a lot of um, development that, haps, that happens on relatively small lots here. And again, it's because we're in an urban setting. Um, now by 1824, the, the reason the survey was done by Latrobe is because they were interested, they're having water problems here in town. And part of this was to survey the, the streets and decide if there was some regrading that was necessary. So between 1805, when this was produced and 1824, when the fire happened, they started to take some action on, on that regrading project. So, so the streetscape starting to change um, in Newcastle. They're also undergoing some street paving um, during this time period as well. So uh, they're changing from simply a dirt street uh, over to a paved street, um, like we have right out in front of our, our arsenal here on Market Street. This next image uh, is courtesy of uh, Jim Meek and his website, nc-chap.org. It is a 1797 uh, painting uh, of basically the Strand, the Newcastle waterfront. And I'm kind of zoomed in here to a detail section. Um, we're looking obviously as if our perspective is out in the river on a boat, looking back towards the Strand. And so this is the area that's gonna be affected by the Great Fire of 1824. So over here, we see the Van Leeuwenhoek house, I believe. And then uh, this would be, I guess, what the Jefferson House is. And then all of this area up here is going to be affected by this fire. Um, we are, of course, looking at the back of the buildings um, that are on the riverside. But things to notice here is just how packed this area is with, for our purposes, combustible <laughs> materials, right? So we have a mixture, as I said, of frame buildings and wood buildings. But if you take a look at here, there's all this lumber piled up here. There's casks and barrels and crates around here. There's storage buildings. All these things are like right on top of each other. Let me take a look here. Uh, I see a couple of names or hands up. Uh, Jack, do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how that got there. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Just checking. I think Sheila has had a hand up too, but that might've been a vote. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't leaving anybody hanging there. No, so, that's left it where I, I got to get it off. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, so, uh, so this is like kind of the the, the setting for um, this drama that's about to unfold here. We have one more image to take a peek at. Um, most people may recognize this image as well. This is part of Latrobe's 1805 survey, and this is uh, in available down at the Delaware Public Archives and also on Jim's website again. Um, what, to, what you wanna notice here is again, the part that's gonna be a part of the strand that's going to be affected by this uh, fire that's gonna occur. Over to the left, these first two buildings that you see here, uh, that is the Gunning Bedford House and the Richard McWilliam House. So those are, I think the numbers are six and eight, the strand. So they're the first two buildings um, on the Strand at the time. Those two were survivors, so they're still there on the Strand. If you go all the way to the right side of this image, you'll see the George Reed II house. That obviously is still around too. Um, so that's another survivor from the fire. All the buildings in between those are gone. They were all destroyed in this fire. So this just is a good way to give you uh, a look at what the Strand looked like um, prior to the fire in 1824. It looks very different now. If you look at some of these buildings, you can see some of these are clearly wood, wood construction buildings. This one's frame, you know, this one's frame. Um, this addition might be frame to a, to a brick house. It's a little hard to tell, but um, it's, it's a real um, mix of building sizes, 
um, materials. Uh, but you, one thing you can see is they're all close together. And that, of course, is a, is a uh, key element as to um, the, what happens in the fire and the way, the way it goes. So let's get on to the fire then. Going back to our Latrobe survey, and you'll see the little flame icon here that shows where the fire gets started. Um, and just to orient you again, here's Delaware Street coming up and down, and here's the Strand. This building right here is the Jefferson House. So we're, we're on the property of the Jefferson House, but behind it. And I'm going to read you a uh, eyewitness account of the event. It's actually um, the memory of a, of a girl who was 12 years old at the time of the fire. And she writes this uh, reminiscence uh, later in her life, but she gives a great amount of detail um, regarding the fire. As you can imagine, it's not something that you're going to easily forget. So her name was Sarah McCullough, and her family lived on the Strand. So this has a particularly personal uh, uh, aspect to it. So uh, I'm going to quote, I'm going to read her quote about how she found out. It was on Monday, April 26th, 1824. We were in school and at three o'clock was heard the, to us, unusual cry of fire. Without waiting for leave, all simultaneously rushed out down Reed's Alley, as it was called, when it was discovered that Mr. Bowman's board yard was on fire and that it originated in an old shanty called Riddle's Stable. So what I picture from her story there is it sounds like she was a student, maybe at the academy building. And when she heard this cry go out, she and all of her uh, student friends all ran out of the building at the same time, leaving the teacher there trying to control everybody, right? Um, and then they came running and I can just picture them running down past Emanuel Church, across Market Street, heading right down Reed's Alley, which is, that, which is that really narrow little alley. You can't even tell it's there sometimes. It runs right down behind the Reed, uh, the George Reed II house popping out onto uh, the strand. And can you imagine what they got when, what they saw when they got there? Of course they could see the smoke, but they were looking down the strand and suddenly this had to just be uh, absolute mayhem down here as people were running around trying to react to this fire. And so she, um, she says that the fire started in the board yard of Mr. Bowman. So Mr. Bowman was the property owner. He had a lumber yard um, there at the property of the Jefferson house. And she's saying that the fire started in uh, a little shanty out back called Riddle's Stable. So Sarah's memoir continues. The wind blew fiercely and soon each neighbor feared for himself. That whole side of the street must go, said one and another. But we hoped to preserve the Western side on which our own home was. This was owned by my father, as well as a large store full of goods, which he occupied. Also, it's adjoining hotel together with two storehouses full of grain, all these on the riverside. So she was, her property, her family's property was um, very nearby what was happening um, just a little further down the strand. So she's describing the Western side, worried about the Western side here and, um, the McCullough's property, her family property, was was right here, um, in this area of the Strand, um, uh, just uh, to the to the south of the of the garden wall at the George Reed Two House. Right now, um, they also own the property across the street. Um, and they had the Stage Tavern, um, as well as a store um, directly across the street. So they had a lot of property right in the middle of the Strand, um, and so she was, needless to say, a little concerned about what was happening. So she continues in her description. She says, all was confusion. Fire apparatus was hardly to be found. From Wilmington soon came help. Each did his best, but the flames continuing to spread soon crossed the street. As she stated, the fire jumped from the river side of the street over to the western side of the street at the location of the fourth lot from the corner of present day Delaware Street. So it skipped those first two houses, the Gunning Bedford house and the McWilliam house. 
and the wind was blowing from the south, blowing uh, northward. So it, it didn't blow the fire backwards to those two houses, which was, of course, fantastic that they've been preserved. But now it was starting to burn up both sides of the strand at the same time. So let's see, how far did the fire spread? It was extensive. Um, a Wilmington newspaper describes the progress as it burns up the western side of the street, moving from house to house, occupying from the fourth lot. Then this, this account really gives us a great idea of who was living where and what they were doing. It says, from the fourth lot, it then went to two houses adjoining, one of which was occupied as a bakery. From thence, it communicated to Mr. Janvier's large dwelling, then to a small house belonging to the steamboat company then to Mr. Saxton's brick dwelling and stable, then to a brick dwelling and the stores and dwelling of Mr. Raynow, then to Mr. McCullough's dwelling house, then to a brick house occupied as a dwelling and dry goods store also owned by McCullough, then to the large dwelling house of George Reed Jr. Esquire with back buildings, etc. And here, happily, the progress of the flame was arrested between six and seven o'clock in the evening. So it was a three to four hour ordeal on the western side of the street before they were able to um, uh, stop it. Um, fire companies kept the roof of George Reed Jr.'s house sufficiently wet to prevent it from catching on fire. Unfortunately, the home of his father, uh, George Reed Sr., the signer of the Declaration of Independence, that house was a frame structure and that was destroyed in the fire. So. Uh, that George Reed Senior House stood right where the, the current garden is uh, at the George Reed House. Another contemporary newspaper account provides some more detail about how the fire spread so quickly, particularly on the river side of the street. Um, that newspaper says the wind was blowing fresh from the south, which sent the flames northward to Jeremiah Bowman's lumberyard, and from there continued north, consuming the remaining houses, stores, and the Union Line Hotel before being stopped by the 120 foot wide vacant lot opposite the mansion of George Reed. So that big lawn that we're used to seeing opposite the George Reed mansion was basically a fire break. So it got to that point, ran out of combustible material and stopped. So uh, in addition to Sarah McCullough, who at this point in our story has just lost all of her family property, um, we have another Newcastle resident who leaves us um, a record of the day through a letter that she was writing um, to her husband. Um, her name is Maria Booth Rogers, and she was in Newcastle the day of the uh, fire and was one of the people trying to react uh, to it. Her husband was out of town, but she was writing this to relay to him um, what was happening. And here's what she says. We are all here in a state of alarm and confusion. A most destructive fire broke out at about three o'clock in the afternoon in a stable or some back building of Mr. Riddle on the wharf. The wind blowing very fresh from the north communicated it to the board yard, which with all the buildings on that side of the street, except the house occupied by Mr. Bowman and two frame ones next to it are all destroyed and all on the other side from Mr. Roberts to George Reed's. With difficulty, the bank and Mr. Roberts were saved. You can have no idea the scene of horror it exhibited. Imagine the hole on fire extending to the other street, all the back buildings on both sides of Water Street, females crying yet very actively engaged in carrying water. I am almost exhausted with fatigue. I've been carrying water and furniture all afternoon. The furniture is lying about the streets. And this map, my great icon iconography here, shows where they were placing all the furniture in an attempt to salvage it. She says the furniture is lying about the streets, the market house filled, the arsenal, and almost all the street the market house stands in, some in the meeting house and in the churchyard. So as you can imagine, as this fire is starting to forget, progress, if your house is in the, in the path that looks like it's headed, you're gonna be pulling everything out of your house. And the first place you're gonna drop it is probably right in the middle of the street in front of your house, right? You're trying to get it out of the house so it doesn't burn. 
And you're probably, you know, going after things that are going to be the most valuable, valuable furniture, maybe the, the expensive fabrics you might have in your house, whatever you think is most valuable to you, you're going to pull out and throw it into the middle of the street in an attempt to save it. Um, a reporter from the uh, newspaper, which was called the Watchman in Delaware Advertiser, wrote, so rapid was the progress of the fire that large quantities of store goods and household furniture were destroyed after they were moved into the street. So even though you pull them out of your house and put them in the street, that fire is just whipping around. And these are, again, combustible materials. They're going to go up right in the middle of the street. So even though you're doing your best to save your possessions, they're burning right before your eyes. It had to be just uh, uh, an unbelievable scene. Now, both the Union and Penn Fire Companies of Newcastle fought the blaze along with many private citizens, uh, as you heard from Mrs. Rogers. A cry for help was sent to Wilmington and additional firefighters and equipment responded. The fire burned into Tuesday night. Um, so it, was, it went over 24 hours long and rains during the day of Tuesday probably prevented the fire from continuing to burn longer than that. In the end, 23 homes and three inns were destroyed and many people in Newcastle lost their, their livelihoods. One sixth of Newcastle's population was homeless. The financial loss was estimated at upwards of $100,000. So $100,000 in 1824 is an, an, an enormous sum. Um, you'll, you'll hear it a little bit, people were able to rebuild their house for about $2,500. So if you think about that's the price of a house, um, when you say it's $100,000 of damage, that's a lot of, a lot of serious, serious damage. Sarah McCullough, our 12-year-old eyewitness, um, described the plight of her family as well as 22 other people um, after the fact. She says, before night, we were houseless and homeless, and so were most of our neighbors. This whole property had been purchased by our father from James Gardner of Philadelphia and paid for in annual installments, the last of which had just been paid, literally just paid off their house. Um, Mr. G kindly refunded that part of that last payment as a present to them. She says specifically, no insurance had been made for their property. On that memorable night, I and my younger sister slept at Mr. Moody's, which interestingly is the Amstel House. So that's kind of a direct tie-in for us here at the Historical Society. She said the whole town was in an uproar. Uh, the Delaware Gazette and Pennsylvania Advertiser um, reported, never have we seen a spectacle more distressing than this once beautiful town presents. From the north to the south on Water Street, little is to be seen but tottering walls and solitary chimneys. And this section of the place, which was once the theater of business, is now abandoned and left a solitary heap of ruin and desolation. It sounds like the end of the world here. It's like an apocalyptic event that happens here in Newcastle. I'm sure it had to seem that way to the people that were, that were going through it. So on Tuesday night, the evening after the fire, our, our letter writer, Maria Booth Rogers, um, finished writing the letter that she was planning to send to her husband. And there she says, the fire is still burning, but it has rained hard all the afternoon and no danger is now apprehended. It was really distressing this morning to walk around the town and the desolation it has made and those that have not to lay their heads except taken in by their neighbors. Looking for their furniture, some in one place, some in another. However, it is impossible to give you a full description of the scene of distress. And yet we have reason to be thankful that no lives were lost. If it had happened at night, it would have been much worse. Although I have not slept any except an hour or two this morning with my clothes on, yet I feel such a dread on my mind that I do not feel as if I wish to sleep. I feel grateful that we have escaped and have to feel distress only for others. At one time, I was apprehensive that the whole town would be burned. So that leads us to the million dollar question. How exactly uh, did the fire start? It's the most obvious question, one that we ask for after every fire. So it is not the girl from the famous firehouse memes. And if you have no idea who this girl is, congratulations. Uh, that means you have a healthy relationship with, with your internet. Uh, so 
in, in researching this topic, I actually did find an actual image of the of the culprit behind the beginning of the fire, and I'm going to share that with you now. Yes, I mean, here he is. Look at him. Look at that mug. He is guilty, clearly, by the look on his face. In actuality, our 12-year uh, our 12-year-old eyewitness, Sarah McCullough, gives us the answer to the question of how the fire started. In her memoir, she says, it originated in an old shanty called Riddle's Stable through two little boys, John Roberts and Dick Riddle, making a fire to warm some pups. So this guy's kind of an accessory, really. It's his cuteness that got us all in trouble here in Newcastle, I think. Um, so it was a couple, a couple of boys that um, were trying to keep some puppies warm um, in the barn, and unfortunately it took off from there. Oh, it's not advancing. We're stuck looking at this little guy. There we go. <laughs> oh, I think uh, Elena, do you have a question? Is he in hand pop up? Yes, on the um, on the guide tour, when we go on the uh, train, we talk about the fires. How are we going to say uh, anything about ghosts because nobody lost their lives? <laughs> I don't think we ever were talking about anybody who uh, was killed during the fire, at least. there. I'm sure there are ghosts on the strand for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Pleasure. Thank you. So what happened after the fact? Um, well, after the fire, the town came together to take care of its citizens, as we always do. Um, some neighbors um, offered immediate assistance. Um, Sarah McCullough remembered, um, she says, the next evening we met our father at the hospitable table of our neighbor Sawyer. Um, and he was in much distress uh, to see us. That evening, we two younger ones went uh, with our Uncle James out to Rosedale Farm, where we spent a week. We soon learned that our kind neighbor Sawyer has offered us part of his house. So in we went, and childlike, we're delighted with the novelty. But we now had to experience straits such as we'd never known before. In these quarters, we were suffered to live rent-free for one year, when by getting $1,900 of the amount collected in Philadelphia for the sufferers and other help, our father put his store and dwelling house back up, but he never recovered this shock to his fortune. So she basically says we had to be taken in by a family that lived here in the town for a whole year. And it wasn't until um, charitable contributions came in for the relief of the people that lost things, um, uh, and primarily from Philadelphia, um, that her father was able to get some funding and able to um, uh, to rebuild some of some of his losses there. On April 28th, um, a meeting was called in Newcastle for citizens uh, that were not directly affected by the fire uh, to get them to help plan uh, a way to assist. Uh, in addition to raising money in Newcastle and throughout the state of Delaware, it was decided to also request assistance from other states and communities. A committee of five men um, was appointed to assess the damages and organize relief, relief efforts. Um, the relief committee members were James R. Black, David Wilson, John Moody, Kenzie Johns Van Dyke, and Dr. Henry Colesbury. Similarly, another committee was formed to correspond with other states, cities, and towns in order to solicit aid for the help of Newcastle. The members of that committee were James R. Black, Kenzie Johns Jr., Charles Thomas, um, and Thomas owned a hotel down at the, uh, the end of the Strand of uh, the Thomas Hotel, now the Emanuel Parish House, uh, Richard Smith and Kenzie Johns Van Dyke. Should I get our screen to advance again? There we go. News of the fire spread quickly and was reported in, in newspapers throughout the United States. And so was the call to aid the families devastated by the fire. Newcastle received a great deal of financial support from communities in other states. Philadelphia organized committees in every city ward to collect donations to send to Newcastle's residents. And they also authorized the captains of steamboats that were operating on the Delaware to collect money for the cause. Uh, the city of Boston, who, uh, who recalled the financial assistance that Newcastle provided during the blockade of its port during the American Revolution, uh, sent aid to the city as well. As uh, relief started to arrive in the town, um, the people of the town began the process of rebuilding, just like Sarah's father. Many of the affected families did not have fire insurance. 
So they were reliant almost completely on the incoming relief to try and put their lives back together. Um, one family that did have fire insurance were the Jan Beers. Um, they received $2,500 from insurance and were able to rebuild on the same location as their original house, today's 17 The Strand. Um, I want to take a second to talk briefly about fire insurance because um, there's a lot of confusion about how it worked back then. Um, in 1752, Benjamin Franklin created the first successful fire insurance company in the colonies, and it was located in Philadelphia. He called it the Philadelphia Contribution Ship for the Insurance of Houses from Lost by Fire. And he modeled it after fire insurance companies in England that formed after the Great Fire of 1666 in London. Um, so houses would that were insured um, would have often a, an insurance marker um, placed on them. And basically it was pre-advertising um, that these property owners are insured against financial loss by fire. Here's the important point. There's a myth out there that, that if you didn't, uh, if you weren't insured or didn't have one of these markers on your house, that your house would be left to burn. So contrary to that belief, a house without a fire insurance marker would not be left to burn. Volunteer fire companies worked hard to extinguish all fires, regardless of insurance coverage on the building. And this should be fairly common sense once you stop and think about it. Think of the way how closely we're all packed in here in Newcastle. Allowing a building to burn threatened other nearby structures um, with destruction. So there was no way a fire company was going to let that building burn just because it wasn't insured. Um, it didn't matter to them, it was a matter of survival. They needed to put that fire out. Sarah McCullough's father, James, was able to rebuild um, his properties after the fire, just like the Jan Veers. And he constructed the row of houses that today occupy numbers 12 through 33, the Strand. Number 25 was the location of McCullough's Stage Tavern right there on Packet Alley. Um, it's easily recognized today for the, for the large ivory soap advertisement on its sidewall. In addition to rebuilding the town over the next couple of years, the city also worked to improve its ability to fight fires uh, that happen in the future. Newcastle's Penn Fire Company invested in a brand new fire engine, which they named Goodwill. Uh, it was a large engine, hand pumped, uh, but even though it was hand pumped, it was still powerful enough to reach the, the very highest buildings in the town. So the Great Fire uh, in, of 1824 was so completely devastating the town that it's, as I said at the beginning, still widely known, still discussed. Here we are today talking about it virtually. Um, unfortunately, it was not the, the last major fire to affect Newcastle. Um, I'm sure all of us have memories of different fires that have happened in, in the uh, town recently, um, including one at the Hermitage, uh, the Emanuel Church, uh, the David Finney Inn, and then one goes a bit further back uh, south of Newcastle, devastating explosion down at the Amico plant. Um, thankfully, all of those um, fires um, were addressed quickly uh, and ably by our all-volunteer fire company, the Goodwill Fire Company. So guess where they get their name? From that very, uh, that brand new hand pumper that they bought after the, uh, after the Great Fire of 1824. So I have a Goodwill uh, Fire Company's website up here for you. You might want to check them out, a little, learn a little bit more about the fire company. Um, and all that they do here in, uh, in Newcastle for us. So with that, I'm going to bring my discussion of fire to a close here. So here is my contact information if you want anything. But if anybody has any questions right now, I'm happy to take them. And hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you.